Dean McCannell, catedrático de paisajismo en la Universidad de California, ha impartido clases y conferencias en numerosas universidades por todo el mundo, Temple, Rutgers, Berkeley, Francia, Reino Unido, es miembro del Consejo de la Asociación Internacional de Estudios Semióticos, miembro fundador del Instituto Internacional de Investigación del Turismo, también director ejecutivo de la Sociedad Semiótica, eh, Semiótica de América. Eh, han, ha publicado numerosos textos y libros, eh, os comentaba este, El turista, una nueva teoría de la clase ociosa, es un libro de los años 70, que está publicado en Melusina, y por no alargarme, tan solo citar el artículo que hizo para el libro eh, editado por José Azuleika y Ana María Wash, Aprendiendo del Guggenheim de Bilbao, también por darle un contexto local. Muchas gracias a todos, gracias Dean por estar con nosotros esta noche. Thank you all, yeah. The, I don't want to hear myself. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation to visit a part of the world that we always love to come back to. Uh, and thank you to the foundation and its mission uh, that would support this kind of thinking, uh, thinking without uh, banisters. Um, I'm going to read to you so that uh, it makes the task of the translator uh, simpler. Uh, and so uh, I, let's just begin. I, I will start with a, a brief quote uh, from Jacques Lacan, crucial and controversial as everything he said uh, in seminar 11. Lacan writes, any shelter in which may be established a viable, temperate relation of one sex to the other necessitates the intervention of that medium known as the paternal metaphor. I will be coming back to that later. Life in the modern, some say the postmodern world is enormously complex even before we attend to its political currents. This is not a matter of new technologies which have become child's play. It is the great diversity of motivations hidden in our everyday encounters that makes life impossible to navigate intelligently. Almost everyone we deal with moves into and out of our lives without leaving a trace or a clue about their character, whether they intend to help or harm, whether we are the object of their schemes or their utter indifference, all of this secretly, all of this expertly secreted behind smiley faces. I tell my students that it is not possible for a person today to have experience that would equip them to figure out what is going on all around them. Our only recourse is to devour as much quality fiction, film, art, poetry, drama as we possibly can to supplement our paltry direct experience of the human condition. As we are confronted with complex motivation, ethical, moral, emotional, and character quandaries and intrigues on the road ahead, our main ally is the truths contained in fiction. No one in the modern world should trust his own judgment without accessing this supplement to life. Film is an especially accessible and effective art form for representing life in such a way as to provide critical distance and insight on myriad human encounters. Film noir was made in America immediately post-World War II, but it was defined as a genre and critically engaged in France. Its French name stuck even in the francophobic USA. The first book-length treatment was Panorama du film noir américain by Raymond Bourg and Etienne Chometon, uh, published in Paris in 1955. 
The films are most often detective thrillers with an everyman, anti-hero, private eye at the center of the action, down on his luck, compromised, often pursued for the same crime he is trying to solve, frustrated in his attempts to hook up with the femme fatale, wandering empty urban space late at night. You know the story. You've seen it a thousand times. The exercise of theoretical freedom in noir. What is it about noir <coughs> that held first the French and then almost everyone else in its thrall? From the beginning, noir films were quick to exercise a fictional license that today we would call theoretical. This is one of its fundamental defining characteristics. Noir asks, in effect, what does it mean for us to continue to dream of a class-based society in which there is fair play for all, no matter what their position, and the principle of universal inclusion, that is, a society in which the proletariat has a home, a moral voice, and can make a difference, a society in which there is space for everyone. The question is almost eerie in our contemporary neoliberal policy context that favors exporting unskilled and semi-skilled factory work to the third world while promoting a collective fantasy that wealthy nations naturally evolve into consumer societies by succeeding in keeping out undesirables. There is an innocent codependence of film noir sensibility and Marxist criticism, each providing the images and concepts that the other believes it needs. Mike Davis has argued that the intentional structure of Los Angeles-based film noir is that it uses an existentialized Marxism, that's his term, to unmask a bright, guilty place that it insinuates contempt for a depraved business culture and is a mirror of capitalism's future. That's Mike Davis's formulation. Slavoj Žižek similarly but more broadly argues that film noir exposes the symbolic order as something not neutral, not benign. It reveals the universe to be corrupted and threatening, in Slavoj's words, an obscene, sadistic other watches over me. And I think one does. Um, in short, film noir affirmed in a popular genre that capitalism is not a fair game. Noir anticipated several insights that were delivered to much applause by important academic critical theorists in the 1970s and 80s. Foremost, noir exposed patriarchal judgment that only pretends to be disinterested while its true aim is to protect the privilege of elite members of society that they enjoy over others. You don't need to read Fred Jameson or Judith Butler or Davis or Zizek to find out about this. You can just watch the movies. <laughs> These critical insights no longer depend for their conveyance on critical theory or a fictional medium, film noir, with theoretical potential. They are lived daily by the homeless, the hopeless, refugees, and minority youth on their inexorable paths from poverty to jail. Still, there remain things to be learned from noir. The classic phase of noir films, we are repeatedly told, was from 1945 to 1955. But it eludes historical solutions because it instantly became a component of its own historical context. How could anyone try to grasp the problematic details of Western post-war self-understanding without film noir? Noir is our faded old black and white family photo album from this period. Like other albums, it reveals embarrassments that we would prefer remain hidden away 
and some more clues about the origins of current difficulties. 1945. Democracy had just joined forces with Soviet Marxism to vanquish fascism, but a great deal of blood had been spilled in the process. The war pitted European against European and American against European. Not everyone who fought against fascism was deeply anti-fascist. This was forcefully impressed upon the almost 3,000 members of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion who volunteered to fight on the side of the Republic in the Spanish Civil War. Those who were not killed and who returned home were labeled by the United States government as prematurely anti-fascist and blacklisted from gainful employment. Some of the more famous among them, the folk singers Woody Guthrie and Peter Seeger, were not allowed to receive pay for their work until the 1960s. There were close family ties between the World War II adversaries, horrendous violence, murder, and guilt, and thus a need for a totemic ritual to distribute the guilt and to try to assure that there will not be a repetition of the violence. Popular entertainments would privilege forms that affirm the winners are not perfect and the losers are not all bad while searching for a new common enemy. By openly questioning the ultimate goodness of capitalist and democratic values, film noir potentially contributes to some of the hardest ritual work of expiating guilt for World War II. Its durability may be tied to its advanced ritual functions, but as ritual, noir brings a more complex set of critical problems, like the mother who favors the bad child because no one else will. Putatively left-leaning noir films exhibit a certain tenderness toward fascism in the pure heart of democracy. One finds in noir films an aesthetics of violence and other fascist values on both sides of every moral equation. The good guy is as likely as the bad to resort to intimidation, physical punishment, and extrajudicial execution. Film noir provides a critique of global capitalism's corrosive impacts on culture and society and documentation of the collapse of the paternal metaphor. Its ritual function is an inoculation against these emergent post-war conditions. Identification with noir heroes allows the viewer to live passively within a new malevolent brand of capitalism while imagining oneself to be opposed to it. The dice are always loaded against the anti-hero of noir. He knows this and persists anyway he wins a moral victory by fighting against corrupted paternal authority, engaging in some of the same violent practices as employed by authority. The everyman hero usually loses, but we are happy if he does not lose too badly, given the forces against him are massive, even global. Raymond Chandler, the brilliant writer of hard-boiled detective fiction on which many noir films were based, comment that their authentic power came from, and this is a Chandler quote, the smell of fear which these stories managed to generate. Their, their characters lived in a world gone wrong, a world in which long before the atom bomb, civilization had created the machinery for its own destruction and was learning to use it with all the moronic delight of a gangster trying out his first machine gun. The law was something to be manipulated for power and profit. The streets were dark with something more than night. This is from Chandler, Trouble is My Business. Noir's Dark Secret, Exclusionary Democracy. The fear generated by these stories <coughs> arises from the way they reveal a new tension between corpulent capitalism and democracy. 
This tension is mentioned in passing in some noir criticism, but not fully engaged. Noir anticipated the attack by capitalism on democracy that is now producing multitudes of the domestic homeless, the international stateless, soon to be followed into penury by everyone else except super elites. The problem that Noir foresaw between democracy and capitalism begins immediately post-war <coughs> with an aggressive pragmatic drive on the part of capitalism to make democracy do its bidding or to clear it out of the way. After capitalism defeated its external enemies, fascism and communism, and entered its final golden age, it increasingly turned its powers to attacking its old business partner, democracy, for harboring and promoting what elites now regard as historically antiquated, inefficient ideological surplus. From the perspective of capitalist elites, the historic purpose of its partnership with democracy was one, to break the privilege of all remaining 19th century aristocracies, clearing the way for new entrepreneurial leadership, and two, to win the hearts and minds of socialists and others still tied to non-capitalist modes of production by offering them freedom of expression and assembly. Once traditional aristoc aristocratic privilege is destroyed and everyone is involved in the same system of global economic exchanges, there is no further need for democracy, at least not from the standpoint of a smug and successful capitalism. In fact, in the current historical moment, any openness or broad base of decision making or balancing of different interests or voice for interests other than economic self-interest is increasingly seen as intolerably opposed to the continued development of free market economies. Only a sold out democracy, one that has taken a bad turn and believes its role is to kiss up to capital, is acceptable. A democracy that goes through the motions of giving the voice to the people while it actually supports continued narrowing of social and economic interests and throttling the voice of the people. In classic film, noir, classic film noir had an almost fatal fascination for the confrontation between capitalism and democracy, which it witnesses with an implacable numbness. In noir films, a tainted but slightly compromised democratic hero battles representatives of big capital to a draw or a near draw. The basic principle that is compromised in original noir films and democracy it is, as it is currently inflected is inclusion. Everyone is supposed to have a place in it, in democracy. Everyone is entitled to a modicum of paternal protections. Everyone has a voice. Anyone can win. In film noir, this voice, in the form of a voiceover in classic noir, became one of bitter compromise. The players in noir films usually know they are on the take, living off crumbs thrown to them by their oppressors. Still, they are capable of cynical detachment, even from their own condition, able to see all sides of a situation and their role in it. The heroes move freely through every conceivable kind of social space, only those who actually do as they are told and stay in their places and admire and look up to their cruel bosses are represented as servile and abject. The spaces of noir. What precisely does it mean when we say of someone today that they are homeless? If we view them through the lens of film noir, technically it is not a home that has been denied the homeless and the stateless. It is an acceptable place in democratic society. That is to say, a place in the symbolic order. Unfortunately, they fare a little better in critical theory, fiction, politics, and policy. My homeless respondents have managed to build architecturally creative homes for themselves from cars and vans, packing crates, old camping tents, 
parts of freeway overpasses, subway systems, and the like. When I see images from the current refugee crisis in Europe, the ad hoc piles of people and belongings are eerily familiar. Some are brilliant solutions to the problem of temporary home construction. Some are not even that temporary. I met a woman in Washington, D.C., living in a system of boxes over a heating grate on a crowded sidewalk on Pennsylvania Avenue. She had an easy chair with side tables, they were boxes, but side tables, a Coleman lantern for reading at night, a battery-powered portable television, which she shared with passers-by, and a large canvas that she wrapped herself and her stuff in at night to hold the heat and produce a more or less official-looking protected stack of boxes. What she lacked was not a home, but a proper place, a shelter under the dominion of the paternal metaphor. The societal investment in this kind of place is changing. It is the only kind of location or address that properly can be used socially to identify her, which would allow others, including her family, but also representatives of the police, the Internal Revenue Service, the Welfare Department, to find her. In other words, my acquaintance had a home and even neighbors including United States Senators and members of Congress who often stopped to chat with her on their way to work. But her home did not provide her with a social place. She was excluded from the social order in many other crucial ways. She could not register to vote, apply for work, file a crime report, or any other taken for granted right that requires one to give an address. Similarly, a homeless teenage girl in Oakland, California, told me that she enjoys school and loves and respects her family, but she experiences enormous anxiety toward the end of the school day when it is time to go home, because she is never quite certain where her family will be. Her parents and her siblings are her home, but it is constantly on the move. They make arrangements every day to meet at a specified place, but the places change and she sometimes has difficulty finding them. And when she does find them, often a family member is not there to meet her because they've been detained by police or delayed at a shelter office or recycling center. And when no one is there to meet her, she does not know where, whether she should stay in place hoping eventually to be found, or to go in search of her family. And if she moves, it is to a purpose of finding her family, but no matter which way she turns, she cannot know whether she is getting closer to or distancing herself from her goal. And asking for assistance always exposes her to danger from the authorities, police, and child protection agencies, violent criminals, and the like. Her situation is analogous to that of the noir hero, but for her, it is life. It is not just the homeless that are being coming detached from the social totality. There are additional millions who are driving around without licenses or insurance, can't afford to pay their taxes, will never vote from lack of, of, of desire or because they've been blocked from doing so, are behind on their rent, and about to sneak out on their landlord are nominally in school but fail to attend most days. The structure of displacement or placelessness is problematized in film noir by the pseudo expulsion of the hero from all viable temperate human relationships. It's a dramatic trope. Unlike the homeless and the stateless, emphatically lost to the symbolic order, the noir hero always hangs on to hope that even a compromised democracy can continue to provide a place for everyone and to guarantee fundamental freedoms. Once the hero pays the original price, that is, loses his credibility with his wife and children, they're gone, or loses them altogether, he starts to move through any and every situation as a kind of cipher of an unrealized possibility of the coexistence of democratic openness and capitalist closure. 
the hero abjures regular ordinary routine, normal for-profit pursuits and schedules. He does not have an evident class perspective, operates within the law only when it's convenient for him to do so, and has few institutional attachments or obligations. He lost his place as the head of his family, but never really gives up his place in the symbolic order or gives up hope in the possibility of restoring a sheltering paternal metaphor. The hero demands a paradoxical combination of rights to be completely detached from society and at the same time to be allowed total access to every part of society. The homeless and the stateless today would see his combination of attachment and detachment as manifestations of good fortune and bad faith. He holds himself external to and above specific class relations, domestic relations, institutional ties, and the like, in order not to be marked by any specificity, so he is free to enter into everything. If a thug or other capitalist lackey attempts to block his entry into a club or a back room where a deal is being made, he shoves the thug aside. Philip Marlowe walks freely through the mean streets of the city's underside in one scene of The Big Sleep, and in the next he strides with the same nonchalance across the oriental carpets of malevolent billionaire General Sternwood. In his most positive manifestation, Noir affirms the right of democratic everyman to go anywhere as a matter of principle. If he encounters a capable adversary along the way, it can only be himself. George Stroud, the, the Ray Milland character in The Big Clock, knows from the outset that the mysterious suspect he goes through the motions of tracking down is himself. The film follows his frantic attempts to expose the actual murderer while covering the trail of clues that would lead the police to him. His task is made difficult because he is trapped in the headquarters of a giant prototypical global corporation, one that operates in all time zones, hence the big clock. And because of the great diversity of the settings through which he accidentally left an incriminating trail, even though he's innocent of the crime. These settings include the highest boardrooms and offices of the corporation, a rustic mountain cabin where he should have been vacationing with his wife, the luxuriously appointed apartment of the murdering CEO's mistress, nightclubs and bars at all levels from elegant to seedy, the apartment and studio of a bohemian artist, an expensive antique shop, a pawn shop, ending up eventually behind the scenes of industrial technology inside of the big clock itself. The Ray Milan character treats every one of these settings with equally bemused attached detachment, showing no partiality toward or greater or lesser comfort in any of them. It is left to his lackeys to comment on one of the bars he's been sent to in search of clues. It's a very sordid place. It has disreputable clientele. Film noir established democracy's dark side, not as an articulated message, but as a critically constructed mise-en-scene that is filmic space. The noir hero and contemporary homeless and stateless peoples are in a through the looking glass relation to each other. Originally and in the first place, they and he stood outside the capitalist social totality, giving us our first glimpse of it as something not neutral, not fully inclusive. The noir hero schmoozes and shoves his way back into society where he exposes bias and corruption. He is the cipher of the democratic paradox of inclusion that supports both imperialism and openness to all, the two-way opening of all space. The homeless and stateless signal the end of this double opening. They remain on the outside, 
not outside of just some desired part of capitalist society, not outside the middle class, for example, and, the, and in the working class. They remain outside of class and society itself. Between noir and the contemporary situation of the homeless and the stateless, there has been an absolute shift in what is commonly and implicitly understood by the term society, a shift that remains unremarked by critical theory and especially by sociology and anthropology. The space of noir was inclusive in ways that corresponded to an earlier theoretical ideal of society as promoted in classical sociological texts. Society contained or made a place for all of its members from the highest born to the lowest, from infancy until death, from before birth and beyond death, for the criminal, for the infirm, and the insane. This universal catalog of places was also the mise-en-scene of noir. After Goffman and Foucault, we were forced to acknowledge that having a place for some also meant bearing a radically stigmatized plight or a damaged identity. But under naive classical theoretical ground rules, no one, not even the stigmatized, could be left out. Everyone had to live in society and to remake society together. Through the 1950s and into the 60s, there was something resembling consensus that whenever the economic terms of universal exclusion became visibly intolerable for large numbers in the disadvantaged classes, the wealth should be partially redistributed, either by way of social programs or, if the other party is in power, by riot and looting. That the poor, the insane, or the criminal could simply be turned into the streets that the legitimate members of society could retreat into gated and guarded communities, that the poorest of the poor could simply be excluded from society and asked to keep moving along. These exclusionary societal solutions were and continue to be, even as they emerge as historic reality, theoretically unthinkable. The victory of neoliberal capitalism over other economic forms has been accompanied by a new attitude, a casual indifference toward the socially excluded. Now that capitalism no longer has a global audience, now that it governs every economic relation, the homeless do not necessarily constitute an embarrassment. But they are the carrier, current carriers of noir's guilty knowledge. They know that the ultimate paternal metaphor of society is not transcendent as those who still believe themselves to be a part of it continue to assume, as in society rewards our moral comportment by giving us a proper place. The transcendental notion of society, society rewards, was wrong in the first place, wrong in every sense, morally and empirically. Everyone in society exchanged good behavior for the promise of a better life, either here and now or on payday at the end of the month or after the diploma or upon retirement or in paradise after death. Was it ever right to suggest in effect that morality was something other than its own reward? That people should be paid to do the right thing? No. All they were ever really doing was working for the limitless enjoyment, first of the Père Jouissant, of the 1% capitalist father. And moreover, from the perspective of some homeless people, the system did not work even as in its morally compromised state. They ended up on the outside looking in because they did the right thing, that is, tried to escape an actual obscene father or to spare their mother the additional burden of trying to look after her slightly damaged child themselves. Many of my homeless respondents told me that they, 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 they weren't kicked out of their home, but they just didn't want to add another burden, either economically or emotionally. 
Film noir and the homeless expose the suppressed truth of societies governed by neoliberal principles that they may be filled with every imaginable human type, but none except the super elite ever really had a place in the totality. After the final triumph of capitalism, the paternal metaphor guarantees nothing, certainly not shelter for a temperate relation between the sexes. We should all eventually be able to know what the homeless and the stateless already found out. No one is guaranteed sheltering protection simply by virtue of being a normally behaved, reasonably intelligent, educated, moral, productive member of society in good standing. Anyone can be cast out. It's not a matter of character, identity, mental or other complexity. It involves budget cuts, layoffs, rent deposits, tax code, police procedures, condominium conversions, licensing requirements, bench warrants, dress codes, etc., etc. If there is a lesson for democracy in this negative historical moment, it should be a reminder that below the level of the ultra elites, no person, group, class, or other social segment has any greater social standing than as a model for the others. That is, as a source of insight, like poetry, drama, film, fiction, art. These are not necessarily models that will be copied or emulated, but always ones that can help to shape knowledge and improve the general conditions of existence, either by positive or negative example. The homeless and stateless, now on the plane of history, tell the truth that film noir tried to anticipate that the moral formulations based on the paternal metaphor under capitalism are a sham, that everyone except the ultra elites are standing on the threshold of exclusion. So I will conclude. Is it possible to establish a parallelism between the travels of the homeless and those of the other quintessentially contemporary iconic figure, the tourist? No. It is precisely in this comparison that two different ways of being out of place stand in stark contrast, leaving the homeless, the stateless, and the noir hero on one side and the yuppie tourist on the other. The homeless, stateless, and the noir hero and the tourist all constitute space by their wanderings. The tourist weaves together various attractions and sanitized public fixtures worldwide. The tourist, uh, mo tourist movements in aggregate bind together the high points of global culture, mainly as framed and prioritized by global capital. The tourist sets forth with an understanding the tour is circular, secure in his belief in its circularity, and that his final destination is home. The homeless, stateless, and the noir hero know better than that. Their movements are only incidentally related to official definitions of social space. They move outside of official pathways and cannot return home by definition, in the case of the homeless, or without risk of being caught by the police or some mobster, in the case of the noir hero. If a homeless person or a noir hero stops along the way to watch television in a store window, or to piss in the privacy of a stairwell, or to sleep next to the hot lights of a billboard, it is because these places have been forgotten, at least temporarily, by official marking and policing apparatus. They become temporal interstices in advanced capitalism produced by the passing presence of the excluded. A tourist may assume that everything is owned by someone or the state, and, the, and the identify with the owner of everything, nicely staying between the lines and the officially marked paths that pretentiously bind everything together. Following in the footsteps of the noir hero, for the homeless, the stateless, the refugee, the marked path is not necessarily the best way to get from place to place or the way that offers least resistance. They may feel the need to stay off the road for purposes of movement, the rooftops or the sewers might be better. The homeless use roads, alleys, and sidewalks for something other than movement. 
they harvest them for cans, just as the noir hero once harvested them for false clues he knew were laid down by his adversary. Clues, if properly interpreted, might lead him back to his adversary. They have no use for proper boundaries or any of the other social separations and hierarchies encoded in spatial definitions. And they have few internally imposed boundaries that map onto the external definitions of space. They know that they can never ultimately hide their feelings in the interior of a private space of protected subjectivity. As such, they qualify as the soul or the truth of corpulent neoliberal capitalism. What remains to be seen is whether democracy has the guts to take them back in, to make a place for them over the objections of big capital. Thank you. Gracias.